uh what's up youtube it's your boy lunar you need to like comment subscribe we're gonna do something different and uh this video is what was gaming like in 2004 and i can tell you one thing it was epic uh 2004 that's the year the gamecube release no gamecube dropped in 2001 something came out in 2004 a lot of shit came out in 2004 was it the PSP or the DS? Something came out of 04, and I was just, like, ecstatic. I remember that year very vividly in video games. A lot of shit came out that year. Oh, uh, Let's get started. 2004 was 20 years ago. Most of us were probably kids at that time, so it might be hard to remember exactly what gaming was like back then. So let's take a trip down memory lane and look That's at what, what it was. was honestly Pokemon. a really crazy year Leave for green, gaming. The first Before remakes. we get into the nitty gritty of the hot game releases in 2004, let's start with the console stuff. This was the year that Nintendo launched the Game Boy Advance video, which was a line of Game Boy Advance cartridges yeah. with episodes of TV shows and even full no the ds did drop that year because i had the fucking pokemon i remember getting the pokemon game boy advance video i don't know it may have been 05 that shit came out the ds it probably came out in 04 in japan and came out in 05 in america anyway or the psp probably came out in 04 bro i want to say the psp oh movies no the ds came out before the psp the movies look terrible, obviously, because there's. They was lit. Oh man, I watched the fuck out of these, bro. Super compressed, but honestly, at the time, it was pretty cool to have episodes of some of your favorite shows on the go right there on your GBA. And there were quite a number of shows that had Game Boy Advance video cartridges, like Pokemon, SpongeBob, Jimmy Neutron, Ed and Eddie, and even The Proud Family. In terms of movies, the only feature-length films that were released on Game Boy Advance video were Shrek, Shrek 2, and Shark Tale. Yeah, I remember that one. Speaking of the Game Boy Advance, this year also saw the release of the GBA wireless adapter adapter which allowed multiple GBAs to connect to each other for multiplayer wirelessly whereas before you needed a GBA link cable there was one bro I just bought a modded Game Boy Advance bro and I'm in heaven and I bought like these repro Pokemon cards and stuff look at that look at this bro look at this shit like I bought this Oh, let me turn it on. Look at this screen. It came with a this beautiful fucking screen. Oh my gosh. Look at that. Hold on, let me make this. I don't think y'all can truly see this. Look at how good. Let me get to that. Look how good that looks. Bruh, that is amazing. And this is a BlackBerry screen. And, like, the screen is so good. It's damn near, like, HD for the Game Boy Advance. It's, 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 some <sighs> bruh, lit. Lit pretty big downside to the wireless adapter though which was that you could only use the wireless adapter with games that were designed to be compatible with it in practice what this meant was that if a game was made before the wireless adapters release it most likely didn't have support for the adapter meaning you'd need to use the gba link cable for multiplayer but that's enough about the gba let's get to the big nintendo console news of this year this year was the release of the nintendo ds I nintendo's was right, newest I knew handheld it console which was first unveiled in a prototype form at e3 i fucking knew it, it was in 04 bro i fucking knew it look at me bro I'm old as hell. 2004. This console's release was quite strange considering only three years prior, Nintendo released the Game Boy Advance, which was supposed to be their next generation handheld console. Even stranger is that only one year prior in 2003, they released their new and improved Game Boy Advance model, the Game Boy Advance SP, which had a new clamshell design. Yeah, what was crazy is that I wanted the Game Boy Advance SP so bad because it they came out with the it was had the backlight and the original game boy Advance didn't have a backlight it didn't have a light on it and then my dad told me no 
and then my little brother ended up getting it and then the ds came out he got me the ds so i was like so like my like game boy generation i always like got the like advanced generation like i didn't get the original game boy i got the pocket i didn't get the color i got the events i didn't get the sp i got the ds i didn't get the ds light i got the dsi you see what i'm saying i didn't get the 3ds i got the three the uh 2ds like the uh fat the little what you call it model the one that was like a game boy design which could protect your screen a rechargeable battery that removed the need to buy multiple batteries and a front lit screen allowing you to see the game easier another weird thing about the ds is that nintendo initially marketed it not as a replacement for the game boy advance but instead as a third console in their line of systems along with the game boy advance and the gamecube mm -hmm. some people believe that nintendo did this because they weren't entirely sure if the ds would be a success the ds was an odd console it has two screens instead of one with the bottom one being a touchscreen and it also had a built-in microphone for some reason but the ds did have some legitimately great features at the time like built-in wireless connectivity to connect with other systems using wi-fi allowing for online play over the internet another great feature it had was that it was backwards compatible with game boy advance games which yep. made the idea that it wasn't a successor to the game boy advance that much more stupid of course there were still some reasons to own a gba since the DS couldn't play Game Boy or Game Boy Color games, and the DS didn't allow for Game Boy Advance multiplayer. Even if. Yep, like I kept my game. Like I would take my Game Boy Advance with me just in case. Like, and I remember, uh, like having. I still had like Pokemon Yellow I would play for some reason. And I kept my Game Boy fucking Advance just for that. And, um, I would trade back and forth with my, um,. Rubies and sap my ruby and sapphire and my fire and leaf green just because that was the only way nintendo was concerned about whether the ds would be popular or not their worries were in vain because the nintendo ds was a smash hit it became popular thanks to its plethora of casual games with universal appeal it is still to this day nintendo's most popular console of all time selling over 150 million units but nintendo that's insane even though they combine sales between like the the entire ds lineup like not just the ds it's like the ds dsi ds like they combine all of those so technically don't count even though they play all the fucking Nintendo games. wasn't the only company to release a new portable console this year this year was also the release of sony's handheld the playstation portable and i was right like Nintendo, Sony showed off this console at E3 2004. Sony had already successfully ripped the home console market from Nintendo's clutches, so I guess they figured they could do the same thing with the handheld market. And to be fair, the PSP had some great benefits, like a wide screen for better viewing, some pretty powerful components for a handheld console at the time, allowing for pretty impressive 3D visuals, and the ability to download games off of the internet using Sony's new PlayStation Network, although that feature came a few years later. But not only was the PSP a great gaming console it was also a great multimedia device this thing had the ability to I play put all my fucking movies on the PSP bro and I had bro all this I had all the spider-mans oh my gosh bro music watch videos and even browse the internet the PSP did have its fair share of quirks like the weird nub analog stick the odd decision to use optical discs for games instead of cartridges and of course Sony deciding to use their own proprietary storage device for saving data the memory stick all in all though the PSP was a massive success for Sony this console had a ton of RPGs and entries from popular franchises on previous PlayStation consoles consoles the psp ended up selling over 75 million units it doesn't feel right to talk about nintendo and sony while leaving microsoft out microsoft didn't release a handheld this year or any new consoles at all but what they did do was start halo. their xbox live arcade service oh halo 2 dropped that year in 2004 2004 was lit as fuck god damn
By going to xbox.com and ordering a copy of the free Xbox Live Arcade disc, you could have access to the service. Xbox Live Arcade allowed Xbox owners to download simpler games to their Xbox like Ms. Pac-Man, Joust, and Smash TV. The service would really become a big part of gaming on Microsoft's next console, the Xbox 360, but even on the original Xbox. Xbox Live Arcade was a pretty cute little service for old arcade games and other smaller titles. But now that we've gotten all of that stuff out of the way, let's move on to the main course of this video, the games. Looking back, I was surprised just how stacked 2004 was. Let's start with new entries and old franchises. Game Freak gave us Pokemon Emerald, the third game in the new Generation 3 games that started two years prior with Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Emerald is easily the best version of Gen 3, offering redesigns for the male and female protagonists, a reworked story that incorporates elements of the stories of both Ruby and Sapphire, a brand new post-game location with tons of new challenges, and plenty of other new features. Speaking of RPGs, the Paper Mario series got its second game this year, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. This game is a grail amongst Mario fans, GameCube fans, and RPG fans alike. It says a lot that its remake is one of the most hotly anticipated games I've seen in a while. Mario has never been known for its story, but the Thousand Year Doors narrative helped people realize that, yeah, you can tell a compelling story with memorable characters in a Mario game. While this series began on a Sony platform, another sequel that came out on a Nintendo platform this year was Hell. Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories on the Game Boy. But this is the only Kingdom Hearts game I cannot get through completely because the fucking car system, bro. For real. Like, this one's annoying as shit, but it looks so beautiful on the uh ps2 ps4 ps well i got the ps4 copy but i played on ps5 oh yeah the the, uh, the enhancement the ps5 gives to fucking ps4 games is crazy especially if you play them off disc and they have like unlock frame rate and stuff like that oh my gosh it's like a automatic upgrade off just off rip any listen y'all any game start buying physical games by the way but any game that has a ps4 pro like um version tied to it put it in your ps5 because 9 out of 10 a lot of that stuff is like uncapped frame rates unlocked uh visuals so the ps4 pro can run it or whatever and like basically like give it but on the ps5 it'll like give you a straight up 60 fps with for like native 4k just because it's all unlocked on the disc and that's the difference between now if you put it in now if you put it in the ps5 and like uh, or had a digital copy and stuff all that stuff like locked but the disc versions are not unlocked Kingdom Hearts for many years was infamous for all of its games being important to the overarching narrative and all of those games being released on a bunch of different consoles. And that trend began here with Chain of Memories. Kingdom Hearts has experimented with a ton of different mechanics over the years, but I still think Chain of Memories might be the most unique game in the series. It combines the series trademark action RPG combat with a deck builder. All attacks in this game are done via cards. Each card has has a number and if you use a card that has a higher value than your enemy's card you can cancel out their attack i'd be here for a while if i went into all of the complexities of this game's battle system but it's honestly really cool and it's a shame that the game is frequently overlooked even by some kingdom hearts fans rpg fans were eating good this year with several new entries in old series but first person shooter fans were not starving for sequels this year either 2004 yeah. saw the release of halo 2 which launched with online play allowing you to play against other people over the internet. Doom 3, which brought back arguably the most influential first-person shooter franchise in history back into the mainstream. And of course, Half-Life. Yeah, but niggas don't care, count that Doom. 2004 Life 2. Oh, Metal Gear Solid came out. Metal Gear Solid 3 came out this year uh, in, in, um, in 2004. I, I want to say that's my favorite Metal Gear, by the way. Another first-person shooter Valve game that came out this year that's rather notable, Counter-Strike Condition Zero. This game was the first game to have its initial launch on Valve's Steam service. Steam would end up becoming a juggernaut in the online game distribution. Steam came out in 2004 is insane. 
execution sphere, with thousands of games released for it every single year. Some of the other new titles in old franchises were GTA San Andreas, which is a masterclass in open world games. There's also Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, which is still considered by many fans to be the best game in the series. Burnout 3 Takedown, which is a super zany- Burnout 3 came out in 04, nigga, I'm- Oh, over the top fun racing game and Silent Hill 4 The Room, the last game to be made by the original creators of the series Team Silent. While not brand new games, there were quite a few remakes this year, like Metroid Zero Mission, a GBA remake of the first Metroid game on the NES. It took many of the improvements from games like Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion and added them into the original game, as well as some brand new stuff to spice things up. There was also a new duo of Pokemon games, Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, which came bundled with the aforementioned GBA wireless adapter. These games are remakes of the original first generation of Pokemon games on the Game Boy. I remember as a kid I tried to play Pokemon Blue and I just couldn't get into it. The game just visually was not very interesting due to the limited colors and primitive sprites. A lot of the location- I was the same way. I remember uh, buying Pokemon Blue at this fucking pawn shop and I played it in the car while my daddy was doing some. He was in some meeting or whatever. And next door, it wasn't a pawn shop, it was a retro gaming store in Montgomery. And I went and I seen Pokemon for like fucking $3. And I went and got the $3 from my pops, went and bought it, and then played it in the car and didn't know what the fuck to do and took it right back in there. <laughs> and then I felt like I regretted that decision forever, but no, I didn't. And I ended up getting, I love Fire Red Elite Green, actually, in my, uh, Game Boy Advance, I'm actually playing through uh, Leaf Green uh, right now locations looked very similar to one another, and I didn't like how the Pokemon didn't have unique sprites in the menus. I just wasn't a fan. But when I played Pokemon Fire Red, I had a great time. Mm -hmm. My first experience with Pokemon was watching the 1998 anime, so getting to catch all of my favorite Pokemon from the show in full color with updated sprites, mechanics, and features was amazing. The PS1 classic Metal Gear Solid got a remake on the GameCube this year with Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, featuring greatly improved graphics, re-recorded dialogue, new cutscenes to flesh out the story, and new mechanics added to the game from the previously released Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. There was also Super Mario 64 DS, a remake of the classic N64 game Super Mario 64. This was my first experience. That was the only, that's the only Mario game I ever played. I don't think I beat it, but that's the only one I ever played. That's the only one I ever got into, that Mario game. It's with Mario 64. And while I don't go back to this one as much as the original because of the small screen and lack of analog controls, it still is pretty cool since you can play as different characters other than Mario who each have their own special moves and abilities. Speaking of remakes, I should also mention some re-releases of old games, notably Nintendo's classic NES series, which was a series of re-releases of old NES games on the GBA. Of course you had the ones everyone expects like Super Mario Bros. Bros, Zelda 1, and Metroid, but there were some pretty cool third-party releases like Castlevania, Bomberman, and Pac-Man. Okay, so we've talked about new games in old series, well, how about new games based on old intellectual properties, like licensed games? This year saw a number of great licensed oh, games. Yes. Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 refined the gameplay of the previous entries in the Budokai series, adding in several new characters, mechanics, and balance changes to become a legitimately good fighting game. There was also Star Wars Battlefront a Star Wars first-person shooter that allowed you to take part in battles from all six of the Star Wars movies at the time. The SpongeBob movie game is an actually good movie tie-in game developed by Heavy Iron Studios, the same team that gave us the acclaimed SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom the previous year. The SpongeBob movie game has some great platforming challenges and fun level design that shouldn't be overlooked. And of course, this year also gave us another awesome movie tie-in game, Spider-Man 2, one of Bro. the- 2004 was lit. The grails of licensed games, thanks to its great web slinging mechanic that actually requires a bit of skill to use. It's and you could walk around the city and shit for the first time. Like that was the first Spider-Man game you could be in New York, chilling. 
inclusion of new material that wasn't in the movie to flesh out the game's story a bit more, and its open world, which was fairly impressive for its time. But that's enough about old games from existing franchises. Let's Shin talk Megami Tensei for the DS, bro. about the brand new series that started this year. Let's show Xbox some love and start with Fable. Xbox as a console line isn't well known for RPGs, but Fable was at one point one of their mainstay franchises. Probably Fable's most defining feature was its ability to choose between being a hero or a villain. Obviously nowadays such a binary alignment system is pretty unremarkable, but back in the day this was pretty cool. And being able to see how your actions affect the world around you, how other people treat you, and how your character looks is pretty awesome. Another big game that came out this year was Far Cry. This game plays quite a bit differently from the much more open- Didn't Crisis come out this year too? Crisis 1? And it later games in the franchise, but it still has the fish out of water in a foreign country FPS gameplay that the series is known. This year also gave us Killzone, the Sony exclusive series that everyone forgot. This series seemed like PlayStation's answer to Xbox's Halo, considering they were both futuristic military first person shooters, but Killzone never had anywhere near the same impact that Halo did. Another shooter that came out this year was Red Dead Revolver, the no. first game in the popular Red Dead series. But instead of being an open world game, it's a more straightforward third person shooter. This year also had the zany and surreal Katamari Damacy where you go around rolling everything you can find including buildings, animals, and human beings into a ball. You can't forget everyone's favorite multiplayer monster slaying game franchise that started this year. Monster Hunter, which was one of the PS2 yeah, games that had crazy. online play. And last but not least, I can't not World mention of Warcraft. that this year saw the release of the most popular MMORPG of all time, World of Warcraft. If we look past all of the games from big name established developers like Capcom and Rockstar, we'll also find that this year had a number of some of the first popular indie games, like the surreal dream adventure game Yume Nikki, the Metroidvania staple. Oh, didn't Resident Evil 4 come out that year, 2004? Full Cave Story, and the PS2 and GameCube updated version of the Flash game, Alien Hominid. I think it's important to talk about how much of a big deal this release was. This was a Newgrounds online Flash game that got an official release on two of the big three home video game consoles. Yo. This was certainly a big step for the future of indie games. Of course. I remember the homie went ballistic when he got Alien Hominid, bro. I think he still got this shit to this day of course i didn't mention everything that happened this year and i didn't talk about every game that came out in 2004 i didn't bring up the sims 2 a sequel to the incredibly popular first sims game that helped popularize the life sim genre i didn't mention def jam fight for new york a fighting game with a roster of real life musical artists who were signed to the def jam record label as characters like Ludacris. Ice T and Snoop Dogg. I neglected to speak on Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, which was really interesting at the time since it was a multiplayer Yo. Metroidvania Kirby game. I I think that's the only Kirby game I actually said. No, well, it was a Kirby game for DS I played. It wasn't that one, but I remember that one. I haven't touched on Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, a unique action platformer that made use of these weird controller drums called the DK Bongos controller. And I didn't even comment on one of my personal favorite games from this year, WarioWare Touched, which made great use of the DS's features in its zany micro games. So hey, please feel free to let me know in the comments what games I didn't mention in this video. Sometimes I decide not to talk about certain topics because they'd ruin the flow of the video. Up your sometimes I so honestly good. just forget stuff. And sometimes there's really cool stuff that Dragon Quest 8 did come out in 04. I Jesus. did not know about at all. 2004 really was a phenomenal year for gaming. So many cool games, consoles, and events in gaming. And it was really fun to go back and remember how the gaming landscape was back then. Thanks for watching y'all and have a great rest of your day. Man, we'll never get another era like it was back then, bro, for real. Like, the whole PS, and I know, like, I hype up nostalgia and stuff, but, like, gaming now is so corporate, you know? It's, it's, it takes that extra, nah, that, that love out of it. Like, a lot of, uh, game developers still had that passion and stuff for it.
and I'm not saying game developers don't have passion stuff today. It was just different back then, you know what I'm saying? Like, now, like, if a game doesn't do well, like, you can't sell 100,000 copies in today's time and get a sequel. You know what I'm saying? Get down. You can't sell 100,000 copies in today's time and get a sequel. Back then, a game could sell pretty okay and then you know it become like a decent friend in a nowhere like and then they could do different and wacky stuff a lot of games now have to stick to the formula unless like it's something like you know final fantasy like square still kind of like square let me say they attempt to do stuff differently but even them even they have to even they're changing their ways and how they make games, you know? Like they said, the last fiscal year, like they didn't even like, but they don't, they don't, they don't do good at marketing. A lot of games don't do well for Square because they don't, they don't do marketing. But with how TV and commercial stuff was, and like you was always looking at the next commercial for the next video game on all these channels and shit. And I don't know, man. Like video game was special back in the early 2000s, bro. Like I, I. I'm gonna miss. I, I'm gonna miss that truly. I guess that's why, like, I'm preserving a lot of these games now, hell. But it'll never be the same. Like gaming now, bro. Like it just, it's just different. It just feels different. You can you can feel the corporate aesthetic, the corporate greed, you know, looming inside a game. Anyway, I can go on forever. It was a great video. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. YouTube, fuck with your boy. I know, like, uh, this is a smaller video. You know, it ain't the, the normal numbers, but, you know. Uh, if you like what you see, bro, subscribe to the channel. Peace out.